morning we're going to be talking about affirmative action in South African higher education. Uh, this is joint work with Patrizio, who's over there, and uh, also Vimal Ranchard, who's uh, also a colleague in the, at the University of Cape Town in Seldrew. And before I start, I'd just like to make a few uh, thank yous. One to the university for giving us the data, uh, the applicant data, which I'll be talking about. And the second to the Department of Higher Education and Training in South Africa, who gave us access to their HEMIS database. Uh, and lastly, to uh, Tim Brophy for some uh, help with matching uh, some of the census data that we're going to be using uh, to our applicant data. Um, that's the outline. Uh, so affirmative action is seen in South Africa as a way to make redress for a long history of racial discrimination. Um, returns to education, particularly uh, at the upper end, of, are extremely high. Um, and distributions of both race, uh, uh, of income, and uh, education, amongst many, many other um, sort of life's, uh, li many other uh, concerns that we might have about people's lives are, are heavily uh, skewed by race. And so uh, there's been a recent discussion about actually whether we should have a class or, or socioeconomic status-based uh, policy rather than a race-based policy, which is currently the case. And in fact, for 2016, the university has moved to a, a policy that, that takes an income uh, into account in making decisions about who gets into university and who doesn't, rather than, than just race, as is currently the case. Uh, so this, this kind of matters, and the university's gone ahead and done this, uh, but there hasn't been a huge amount of research, uh, or in fact any, uh, looking at actually uh, the, the kinds of, of impacts that, that affirmative action is having on who gets in and who doesn't, how well targeted it is, uh, and how the beneficiaries and those who are uh, displaced by affirmative action do. So uh, we're trying to answer some of those questions in this, in this paper today. So who gains and who loses? Um, uh, it would be interesting to know about some labor market implications, if there's anyone here, uh, South African policymakers. Uh, it would be useful to have data, for example, in South African revenue services, the tax data, to find out how people are doing. Uh, we can say something, a little bit at the moment only, unfortunately, about the possibility of mismatch that you're... Uh, that affirmative action is uh, allowing into the university people who are not as well prepared, and as a result, they might not do as well when they're in the university. Um, and uh, aggregate social welfare effects, well, those are, that's a little bit beyond uh, what we're trying to do in this, in this paper today. So there's a bunch of uh, literature from the U.S. Uh, looking at... Um, the impact of affirmative action, usually the bans that have been uh, uh, in place in a number of states uh, fairly recently, Texas, uh, California, Michigan, um, showing that if you outlaw the use of race in admissions, that can lead to uh, quite dramatic uh, decreases in, in minority enrollments um, and a reduction in, in applications from, from minority applicants. Uh, although there's some evidence that targeted recruitment programs can offset those, those kind of effects. Outside the U.S., uh, there's some uh, recent work on both Brazil and India. Uh, in India, there's a, a caste-based affirmative action, and there's a paper by Bertrand et al. in the Journal of Public Economics uh, saying that basically affirmative action is successfully targeting the financially disadvantaged rather than um, high-income members of disadvantaged groups, um, and that low-cost entrants uh, obtain a, a positive return to, to admission, um, although they do find that uh, enrollment of women uh, is, is much reduced as a result of, of this uh, cost-based uh, affirmative action. And then there's some also quite interesting work from Brazil. Um, the University of Brasilia introduced affirmative action. I think it was a 20% quota uh, for people who self-identify as black. Uh, and that raised the proportion of black students. Uh, and the displacing students were from quite uh, lower socioeconomic status backgrounds than those uh, who were displaced. So this is kind of specific to the university that I uh, work for, but there, are, there is a big debate in South Africa about affirmative action. Um, I haven't checked the sort of polls, but presumably the majority of South Africans think that affirmative action is, is a good idea. Um, that being said, um, that's not who the university gets pressure from, uh, and 
in fact, I think this move, despite the fact that, that most people think a, a sort of race-based affirmative action policy in South Africa is probably a good idea, that the university has felt enough pressure that it's decided to change its admissions policy uh, in 2016, as I mentioned a bit earlier. So we're trying to answer a number of questions. First of all, what would the, the distribution of offers uh, to, to applicants look like uh, if there was a race-blind admissions policy? And so we're focusing on one particular part of uh, the process that ends up with a bunch of people enrolling in the university. We're only focusing on the uh, applications and offers that are made to these students, not whether they, uh, for the most part, not whether they end up taking up those offers. Um, and how the admissions policy works at the University of Cape Town is that uh, black students, uh, and to, to a lesser extent colored and Indian students, we have these racial categorizations which we uh, are still using in South Africa. The Stats SA still uses them and people still talk about them like this. So this is kind of, they're still very salient in, in, uh, in South Africa generally. And black, Indian, and colored students can uh, get into mainstream programs through lower points requirements, so they need less... Uh, good secondary education results to get in. And then there are also the, these other programs which are for sort of students who are a bit lower down on, uh, even than those students. Uh, they get into extended programs, academic development programs, and only black colored Chinese and Indian students qualify for those kinds of programs. There's usually an extra year, so instead of taking three years for a bachelor's degree, they would take four, uh, and they would get some extra tuition uh, in years one and two uh, to help them uh, adjust to the university. Okay, so in practice, how this uh, policy works is really a, a system of quotas. Uh, the university or targets, the university calls them. Um, let me read one of them to you. The following example applies to applicants for medicine. Uh, it relates to applicants who categorize themselves as black, South African. We set a target number which we hope to give qualified uh, black applicants, and this will be a proportion of the 200 places we have for the medicine class. We set this target because we aim for a diverse medicine class and in order to give redress uh, to black South Africans. And then from 2011, we set overall uh, enrollment targets and equity targets per program. These are aspirational targets, not quotas. That's sort of seen as a bad word, so I think the university wants to sort of avoid saying that it's doing uh, a, a quota system. And all faculties will aim to admit specified minimum numbers of eligible South African black, Chinese, colored, and Indian students. Sounds like a quota to me, but... Uh, Okay, so we have um, applicant data for two academic years, 2007 and 2013, and we have financial aid data uh, only for 2013. And so we have data on all undergraduate uh, first-time applicants and which programs they applied for. And really, we're doing something quite simple. We just want to simulate what would happen if the university used a race-blind uh, selection mechanism when it... Uh, when it um, decided who to make offers to and, uh, and who not to make offers to. And our work is really focusing on applications. Uh, almost all uh, applicants in the data that we're looking at make two uh, applications, but we're looking at applications, not applicants. And foreign students are treated a bit differently. They have their sort of own basket when the university is trying to allocate the places to the different uh, groups. And it's much more difficult for us to do anything with the foreign student data because they don't have the same sort of score that the university uses to rank. Uh, the, the, the person who's in charge of admissions at the university described it to me as kind of like a, a decision by committee rather than just the sort of mechanical ranking of people by their scores that the university does for, for everyone else. So for the moment, we're just going to ignore the foreign students. That's not a sort of value-free decision, and, but for the moment that's, that's really all we can do given the data that we have and, and the data that the university has. Um, and I think quite a novel and interesting part of our research is that um, we have two outside sources of data which we uh, can use to, I think, um, say a lot more interesting stuff about, about what's going on uh, and these sort of questions that I'm trying to answer. 
And so the first is that we have a database of everyone who's registered at a, at a public uh, higher education institutions, um, and we try and link that to the 2007 applicants to work out what happened to them. We know what happened to the University of Cape Town students. We have the, that data. But what we're, what we're also interested in, what happened to the students who didn't uh, get made an offer or chose not to, uh, to enroll even though they were made an offer. And then we also are interested in, in the question of targeting. Does affirmative action successfully target uh, low-income students? And to do that, we have the financial aid data from the university. That's a partial uh, answer. And another sort of partial answer is that we can link the addresses that the university students give to the university uh, to census uh, small area uh, data from 2011 and, uh, and using Google Maps. Okay. So this is the, uh, the, the, the data that we have for 20, uh, 2007 and 2013. Uh, you can see, first of all, that there's a big jump in the number of uh, applications uh, from 2013. That's because we had a change in our uh, secondary school leaving certificate that made it easier for people to get the university entrance um, certificate. And so that meant that a whole lot more people applied. They obviously are not guaranteed to get in, so they... they uh, that didn't, the, the number of offers didn't change that much, but the number of applications changed quite a lot. And what you can see is in both years, black applicants uh, make up about 45 to 50 percent um, of, uh, of applicants. Um, so we're ignoring the foreign students here. Um, and then uh, white applicants are around, or applications are around 30 percent, uh, 23 percent in 2013. And then in the next column, you can, talk, you can see the actual offers that the university made to people. Uh, so it, it made 31% uh, of its offers to black uh, South Africans, 40% uh, to, to white South Africans. So there's a sort of change there. Uh, white, white students are generally uh, have higher uh, point scores when they, when they arrive at the university. The schooling system is very uh, unequal, and that's, that's a key part of, of the explanation. Um, so you can see that there's this sort of a bit of a, a reversal there. And then what we try and do is simulate what would happen if the university uh, made uh, offers just based on the points and not uh, uh, made uh, offers to certain groups and minimum numbers of offers to people in certain groups. And what you can see is that, the, uh, for example, in 2007, um, as a total fraction of offers, uh, the offers made to, to black South Africans would decrease from about 31% to about 25%. Uh, so it's not massive, but it's also not small. Uh, at, for example, the white uh, students, their, their fraction of offers would increase from about 40% of total uh, offers to uh, 47 48%. Uh, and you can see similar kinds of numbers uh, in 2013. Um, Maybe the, the, the jump up uh, for white students is, would be a bit higher in 2013. Uh, the jump down for black students would be a, would be a, bit, a bit lower. So that's our sort of answer to the first question. Um, what proportion of, well, how, how significant is, is affirmative action in, in changing the distribution of offers um, that happens or that are made by the university? Okay, so I think what I'm just sort of repeating, um, perhaps an important point to make those is second from the bottom, that most applications are either always rejected uh, or always accepted. And in 2007, about 17% of, of applications are affected by uh, this change in policy that we sort of simulate between an affirmative action race-based policy to a race-blind policy. And that number decreases to 11.5% in 2013, mostly because there are a much larger number of low-quality uh, offers who are just always uh, rejected whether or not there's affirmative action. So the next question is, is the admissions policy well-targeted? Uh, are black, colored, and Indian students who benefit uh, of lower socioeconomic status. So the first one uh, measure we can use to assess this is the financial aid uh, application and eligibility. Not everyone applies for financial aid, so this is not going to be a very good measure. Uh, and then the second one is per capita income in the census small areas uh, in which applicants live. 
Uh, and this is a bit of a difficult matching process. Google only allows you to match a certain number of things per day, and we made certain agreements with the university about who could uh, use the data and who couldn't. So in the end, what we've done is just do this uh, measure, uh, the census uh, per capita income measure for uh, displaced and displacing uh, students only. And we check how well correlated these two measures are. Um, so this is, uh, we only have this for 2000, uh, 2013. How am I doing for time? Five minutes. Um, yeah. Thanks. Okay. So what you can see is that um, so these are, are row percentages. So of the black uh, uh, applications, uh, around uh, forty percent did not apply. Uh, of those who did, uh, of the total, seven or eight percent were ineligible, and fifty-two percent were eligible. If you look down at the white. Uh, applicants or applications, 88% didn't apply, 4% uh, that did apply were found to be eligible and 6.5% uh, ineligible and 6.5% were found to be eligible. And if we look at, say for example, displacing black and displaced uh, white students, uh, you can see that um, again a large fraction of the white students didn't apply, a very small fraction were found to be ineligible and again a fairly small fraction were found to be eligible. For the displacing black students, 50% were uh, found uh, to be eligible and only 36% didn't apply. You might think, for example, that the, the white students uh, feel that they're going to be discriminated against in financial aid and so they don't bother to apply even if they might be eligible. So you might think this is not a good measure. Um, and so the second thing that we do is to match the census... Uh, thank you. Uh, match the census small area data. These are about 250 households. So we have a very, can zoom in quite nicely uh, on, on the areas uh, where people gave their physical addresses uh, and, and try and work out what's the per capita income in that small area. Obviously, we don't know this for the individuals. Statisa is not giving us the micro data with, uh, with location. Um, so this is kind of a comes from a kind of histogram that Statista gives us of, of in, uh, income in a small area. So it's not household per capita, it's small area per capita income. And what you can see there is the CDFs from the uh, black uh, displacing and the white displaced students. It's in South African rands uh, per month. And the, the stat I like is that the 80th percentile uh, for the black students is about the same as the 20th percentile for the white students. So there's some overlap, uh, but it seems to us that the policy is very well targeted. This is just because in South Africa, uh, race is, is really extremely uh, highly correlated with income, much more so than in the US or, or other places that you might uh, be, be more familiar with. Uh, and then this is just a sort of correlation. Um, this, this is for, um, for the displacing and the displaced students only. This, so this is why the numbers are a bit smaller here, uh, only 2013. And we're just trying to assess whether or not um, there's a good correlation between our measure of uh, our financial aid uh, and, the, and the, the quintiles for uh, small area per capita income. And what you can see is that it's pretty well, uh, pretty well correlated. Most of those who don't apply uh, uh, are in the sort of higher quintiles, and most of those who are eligible uh, are, in the, are in the lower quintiles. So it suggests that, I mean, that's just a, perhaps interesting in and of itself. Do people, are people who don't apply for financial aid sort of high, richer or poorer? This suggests that they're, they're, generally speaking, quite a lot richer, although there are some people in the, in the low quintiles, for example, who didn't apply. Um, I mentioned the possibility of mismatch. This is something that we haven't done enough work on yet. I'd uh, perhaps like to hear some suggestions from, from the audience later on. Uh, at the moment, all we've done is, is, for the 2007 applicants, we've tried to, we've matched them to the HEMIS data. It's a public uh, university uh, data set to find out what actually happened to, to the people um, who, who were either displaced or were displacing as a result of, of the affirmative action policy in the university. And what you can see is that enrollment rates are extremely high. Um, so pub, uh, private universities in South Africa are not as common as they are in many other developing countries. So most people end up, most of the applicants who applied to UCT, uh, whether they got in or not, uh, most of them, or whether they made an offer or not, most of them end up um, 
in a university uh, in South Africa. The graduation rates, however, suggest that there might be some uh, possibility of mismatch. Uh, displacing black students are, uh, have quite low graduation rates relative to, uh, to the displaced white students. Uh, it turns out in a table that I'm not going to show you that this phenomenon of cascading, uh, where d so UCT is probably one of the leading universities in South Africa, and displaced white students end up in kind of slightly lower ranked uh, universities uh, than, than the University of Cape Town or kind of similar types of universities. So we're thinking about some sort of regression discontinuity design type stuff, but at the moment we haven't we haven't got there. So. Just to conclude, the admissions policy does have important effects uh, on the offer distribution. 17% uh, of applications are affected. That's only 11% in uh, 2013. Our results suggest that beneficiaries of the policy are generally a much lower income level uh, than those disadvantaged by the policy. Uh, and there's some suggestion that there's some cost to this and the fact that there's lower graduation rates uh, for the displaced uh, black students, uh, displacing black students relative to the displaced white uh, students, but that definitely needs more work. Thanks.